Good morning. We have general questions. Question one, Malcolm Chisholm. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will make a statement about the consequences for the NHS of a no vote and a yes vote in the referendum. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, yes, I'd be very happy to make a statement on the future of the National Health Service in Scotland as early as possible next week. But as Mr Chisholm will know, that this is subject to approval by the Parliamentary Business Bureau. The Cabinet Malcolm Secretary Chisholm. repudiate the disgraceful scares about NHS privatisation following a no vote, especially when the only evidence he could produce last week at question time was a notional efficiency saving of 0.8% of the English health budget, which even the Department of Health admits is highly problematic. Is he not ashamed to support ill-informed, politically motivated scaremongery about the NHS, especially, especially when privatised services cost more public money, not less, and when the zero... Is it a question there, Mr Chisholm? And I'm please asked, let Mr Chisholm finish. This is my final finish. bit of my question now, when they've calmed down. I know they're... And with 0.8% efficiency saving, which will not materialise, is far less than he himself spends on privatised services or indeed the 3% efficiency savings he demands of health boards every year. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding, presiding officer, I think Mr Chisholm's in the wrong end of the chamber. He should be over there with the Tories. Let me tell him the fundamental issue is the impact on public services of the cuts being made by the Conservative-led administration in Westminster and passed down to the devolved administrations. That is what the fundamental problem is here. We have a Westminster government that believes... Mr Chisholm! We have a Westminster... is guilty. It's a guilty conscience, speaking, <laughs> presiding officer. We have a Westminster government that believes in shrinking the state which believes in doing less through the public realm and passes less money down to us in order to be able to do it. That's a quote from the Labour Health Minister in Wales, Mark Drakeford, speaking in the Welsh Assembly on the 17th of June. Unlike Mr Chisholm, he hasn't sold his soul to the Tories. Ailey <laughs> MacLeod. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Does the cabinet secretary share my deep concern about the adverse impact on Scotland's budget likely to result from the cuts in public funding to the NHS in England as one consequence of the drive to privatise clinical services and introduce charging for NHS services and treatments south of the border? And does he also agree that's why we need full control I think we've got the of question. Scotland's finances, which we've will the yes vote deliver? Cabinet secretary. Presiding officer, absolutely, I'm very concerned indeed, and everybody who cares about the health service in Scotland should be very concerned. As I said last week, the UK government's own assessment of the impact of the English NHS reforms, including privatisation, could amount to a reduction in UK health spending over the next few years of a billion pounds a year. And under the current funding system, which would stay under a no vote, if these monies were to be removed from the health spend and not otherwise used in another area which did not have Barnet consequentials, that could see Scotland lose out on up to £100 million every year on public services like health up until 2020. There is no doubt, presiding officer, a no vote could destroy the health service in Scotland. Question two, Hans Malik. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, presiding officer is to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to address the growing balance uh, in science and maths in schools to increase the number of female students studying science, technology, engineering and maths at degree level. Minister Alistair Allen. When taken together, entries for the three main science higher subjects show strong interest in STEM learning from both genders. Uh, added together, the total number of male entries for higher physics, chemistry and biology in 2013 was 14,056 and for females was 13,026. However, the Scottish Government is fully committed to creating opportunities for young women uh, to undertake further study in STEM subjects and to progress to future careers. A recent report from Education Scotland encouraged staff in secondary schools to recognise and act on gender imbalance in the science subjects where it's necessary. Hans Malik. Uh, thank you for that reply. In a recent letter of guidance to the Scottish Funding Council, the Cabinet Secretary challenged colleges and universities 
to improve the gender balance across subjects. And I support that um, aim. But how can colleges and universities influence the gender balance on subjects such as chemistry, physics, and engineering when the imbalance is firmly rooted in schools at higher level of studies, which results in only 29% of physics being taken up by female students? Minister. Well, the, the member, of course, raises uh, important issues, and, and we all share, uh, I'm sure, uh, an ambition to ensure that we uh, create the, the maximum uh, equality uh, within the science sector. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to say that the, the issues he, he raises are, are quite uh, specifically, around, uh, specifically around physics, because 64% of those taking higher biology uh, in schools are female, uh, and it's 50-50, essentially, in chemistry. Uh, we're not complacent about that. There's a great deal that's been raised in the Wood Commission and its, uh, its comments about uh, the role of science in our economy. Uh, and there's a great deal that's being done through uh, the promotion of positive role models uh, uh, for uh, young women in our schools when it comes to taking science, uh, not least physics. Question three, John Pentland. To ask the Scottish Government what action the Cabinet Secretary for Justice has taken to address the reported delays in the development of a unified IT system for Police Scotland. The, the, the formation of Police Scotland has created an environment whereby a unified IT system can be implemented for the first time, allowing officers to work seamlessly across Scotland that such large-scale integrated IT solutions were not able to be achieved under the previous legacy structural arrangements. Detailed governance and oversight arrangements are in place around this project to ensure that its development and delivery are being progressed in line with the project plan. And I'm confident that development of the I-6 project is firmly on track and once completed, it will assist significantly in the delivery of an improved service as well as sustainable efficiency benefits. John Pentland. Thank you for that uh, response. But with the lack of integration constraining the ability of officers to function fully at the regional uh, or national level, and with routine arming of police leading Jim Sullivan to, re to refer to Police Scotland as the crassest error any politician has ever made, will the Cabinet Secretary accept that the growing crisis of confidence in policing is not an operational matter? Secretary. I'm surprised that the members should take that point, given that uh, uh, he and his party supported the establishment of Police Scotland. It was the right thing to do, because under the previous legacy arrangements, you couldn't get agreement between constabularies, between authorities, as to what IT system to take. I think DCC Living, uh, Richardson has been doing an outstanding job. It is very complicated, very technical. But for the safety of our citizens, to improve the service, we do have to make sure that we do have that seamless uh, link across the whole of Scotland. So I think that the member should recognise why he supported a single service in Scotland, recognise the hard work being carried out by Deputy Chief Constable uh, Richardson, assisted by many others, and recognise that savings will be delivered and the project will be completed. Question four, Jamie Hepburn. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the latest round of funding from the Bus Investment Fund. Minister Keith Brown. It, following the success of the Bus Investment Fund last year, I am very pleased to announce the second round of funding has launched and is open to applications until the end of August. This year we have £3 million available for projects over a two-year period, which will continue to promote the improvement of bus services across Scotland. An announcement on winning bids for this year's fund is expected to be made before the end of this calendar year. Jamie Hepburn. I thank the Minister for that answer. One of the projects benefiting from the first round of funding was the uh, North Lanarkshire uh, connector bus in which North Lanarkshire Council uh, failed to ensure either Cumminald, the biggest town in the council area, or Colsaith. It was connected despite many uh, local people reporting to me problems accessing uh, decent bus services. Does the uh, Minister agree it is incumbent on North Lanarkshire Council to uh, work to address uh, this failure and that the uh, ongoing funding round he has uh, talked of uh, presents an opportunity for them to try and do so? Minister. There is no question that the ongoing funding uh, is an opportunity, but the member will know that bus services in North Lanarkshire are primarily a matter for Strathclyde Partnership for Transport and the Council. Last year, SPT supported 41 local bus services in North Lanarkshire, carrying 1.4 million passengers in total. As the member says, they were successful in securing funding in the first round of the Bus Investment Fund for the North Lanarkshire Connector Bus Project. 
I know that SPT would be happy to discuss with the member, with the Council or other interested parties any concerns about bus services in Cumberland, Old and Gilside and how these might be improved. SPT are currently preparing bids for the second round of the fund and we will consider any proposals carefully against the fund criteria and in the light of the available budget and level of demand. Question 5, Richard Lyle. I would like also to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce the cost of childcare. Minister Aileen Campbell. Investing over £280 million over two years to expand funded early learning and childcare from August 2014 to a minimum of 600 hours for three and four year olds and the most vulnerable or disadvantaged two year olds, 15 per cent this year, rising to 27 per cent from August 2015. This is an increase of almost half from the 412 and a half hours we inherited in 2007 and will deliver a saving to families equivalent to up to £707 per child per year, benefiting around 121,000 three and four year olds this year. In the long term, we have set out in Scotland's future our ambitious plans to transform childcare, which would bring huge benefits to young children and their families. Richard Lyle. I thank the Minister for that answer. Recent space research shows that families in the UK spend 27% of their income on childcare. This is more than double the percentage of income spent on childcare in many small independent countries. What action will the Scottish part, uh, Government take to remedy this fact in an independent Scotland? Minister. Well, I'm very pleased to confirm to the member that we intend to do a great deal with the powers of independence to enhance children's life chances and help families. As set out in page 194 of Scotland's Future, we would in our first budget provide 600 hours of childcare to around half of Scotland's two-year-olds. By the end of the first parliament, we will ensure that all three and four-year-olds and vulnerable two-year-olds will be entitled to 1,140 hours of childcare per year. And by the end of the second parliament, we will ensure that all children from age one to school age will be entitled to 1,140 hours of childcare per year. These proposals represent a transformation in childcare, which would bring huge benefits to our young children and their families. And what a great prize to strive for following a yes vote. In contrast, our help for families with the coalition's welfare reform measures pushing an additional 100,000 children into poverty. Question six, Sarah Boyer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support old, older people who live alone. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presenting officer, over 77,000 vulnerable older people in Scotland receive free personal care, of which nearly 48,000 are receiving their care at home. The Scottish Government also funds a number of projects, such as the Silver Line, which received funding of £210,000 in November 2013 and provides a free 24-7 helpline and befriending service for older people. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? A key fear of many of my constituents and older people in general is the prospect of being stuck in hospital once they've had treatment without access to the right care or rehabilitation services they need to live that independent quality life at home. On Tuesday, the Minister said he hoped to release £100 million over the next two or three years to reduce delayed discharges. Does the Minister have the, the figures of what it currently costs the NHS to fund the whole process of keeping older people in hospital rather than being in home? And does he have that breakdown by NHS board? And does that equate to £100 million? Can I just clarify what I said was if we were able to achieve our objectives in effectively eliminating delayed discharges, that would save the health service about £125 million a year. And that money then would be available for reinvestment in other priorities. And it would also produce better health outcomes for those who currently are subject to delayed discharge. In terms of the cost of keeping someone in a hospital, uh, the average cost across Scotland uh, of one week in hospital is of the order of £4,000 in an acute hospital. In a community hospital, it's around £1,800 a week. And obviously, in a nursing home, it's around £600 a week. And the average for home care is £300 a week. Question seven, Marco Biaggi. To ask the Scottish Government when it will announce plans for reform of the private rented sector. Minister, Margaret Burgess. In May last year, the Scottish Government published its strategy for the private rented sector. As part of the strategy, I established a stakeholder group to examine the suitability and effectiveness of the private rented sector tenancy regime. The group reported in May and recommended that the current assured and short assured tenancies should be replaced by a new private tenancy. I accepted the recommendation and plan to consult on proposals for a new private rented tenancy this autumn. The consultation will also explore issues that relate to rent levels. 
Marco Biaggi. Uh, the 30,000 constituents I have who live in the PRS and those who share streets and, and stairs with them will be uh, very glad to hear of the, the proposals and the consultation coming forward. Does the Minister envisage legislation in this Parliament uh, potentially coming out of this consultation, or would this be an issue for a subsequent Parliament? Uh, as I said in my earlier answer, we do intend to consult in the autumn and we are developing the detailed proposals for consultation and they will be based on the findings of the review group's report. But subject to the outcome of the consultation, it is my intention to bring forward a bill this parliamentary term. Question number eight, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government how it will provide safeguards for rural schools. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. The presiding officer of the government is committed to safeguarding rural schools. That's why we've strengthened the Schools Consultation Scotland Act 2010 to establish more rigorous and specific requirements before a local authority may propose closing a rural school. We've also strengthened the requirements for all school closure proposals, regarding, requiring that these reach high standards of transparency and accuracy and safeguarding schools from recurring closure consultations. These changes were brought into force on the 1st of August. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he agree that some local authorities still fail to recognise the educational value of smaller rural schools or understand their socio-economic importance and the key role they play in maintaining rural communities? Cabinet Secretary. The member raises the, the key issue. A rural school is undoubtedly, uh, its central purpose is undoubtedly educational. But it is um, a, a key facility within the community, and it plays an important role in the economic and social life and development of that community. And that is why the government's proposals and the government's legislation uh, insist that that is considered in terms of closure. And indeed, it is not optional for local authorities to look at economic and social issues. It is compulsory that they look at economic and social considerations, and no closure proposal can go ahead without proving those issues. John Scott. Is the Cabinet Secretary any plans for greater involvement of local communities? I understand uh, is a desire to involve uh, local authorities, but local communities are very vociferous about this as well. Cabinet Secretary. I entirely agree with the member, and I'm grateful for his support uh, on this matter on a number of occasions. It is extremely important that communities recognise that their school is an asset which, if it were to go or disappear, would uh, diminish the way in which the community operates. I'm glad to say that many communities, almost all communities that I know, recognise that and argue strongly and effectively for local education. Uh, question number nine in the name of Neil Bibby has not been lodged. I have an explanation. Question 10, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made on the construction of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. Minister, Keith Brown. Uh, we are making good progress and remain on target to have construction completed by spring 2018. Uh, we announced the preferred bidder, Connect Roads, on the 11th of June 2014. On Monday, at a visit to see some of the advanced works that are already underway, I confirmed that we have now entered into a pre-start uh, contract with Connect Roads to allow them to get the preparatory work started ahead of contract award, which is expected later this year. Murray Mott. Uh, thank you for that answer. I was uh, pleased to be able to join the Minister uh, in my constituency on Monday uh, for that an announcement. Um, but can we have an assurance from him that the work will be accelerated where possible as a commitment to decent infrastructure for the North East, which previous governments have failed to provide? Minister. Uh, yes, I can give that assurance, and as well as bringing forward preparatory works with the pre-start agreement, uh, I'm determined that we continue to look to deliver the benefits of this scheme, around £6 billion over the lifetime of the scheme, which is vital for the North East's economy as early as possible. Uh, the people in the North East have waited far too long for this project. Some have campaigned for decades, and it's this government that will deliver this scheme in partnership with our local authority partners. Lewis MacDonald. The Minister will be aware of the rapid rate of economic growth, particularly in the area of DICE around the airport and uh, in, on DICE Drive. Can the Minister indicate today when he expects to come to a decision about the timetabling of the priority works around the Western Peripheral Route, particularly connecting Aberdeen Airport to the surrounding roads? Minister. As a member knows, we've had discussions with the airport and we've said consistently this will require discussions with the uh, contract winner. We're in the process now of coming to financial close and it's during that process we can have the discussions with the contractor to see which parts of the project may be brought forward. And of course, top of that list would be the, the airport and the DICE area. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much.